Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Uh, this evening and this day, we have something really special for you on the 4th of July. What we have is uh, Samuel Adams, in his own words. Uh, back on August of 1776, Samuel Adams was asked to uh, give a speech as to what his view of the Declaration of Independence was all about. I think it's just imperative that as we look at everything that's going on in America today, you've heard me over and over discuss the parallels in history, and we have that again. When I look at the recent rulings of the Supreme Court, which are not rulings, but in fact, if we would look from Samuel Adams, uh, John Hancock, John Adams, and uh, Patrick Henry, and the remainder of the framing founding fathers of this nation, we can clearly identify that what we saw was judicial tyranny, and we have usurpation without question of our government. Uh, in the last week and the week prior, and the week prior to that, I defined very clearly for you uh, what tyranny and usurpation are. Go back uh, to the last three weeks and look at the archives and listen to those programs so that you can clearly hear the definition as our founders defined it. What we have, especially in this most recent court ruling regarding sodomy, and uh, perversion in behavior is very, very clear. I mean, uh, the Founding Fathers understood sin. That's why uh, those types of behaviors were outlawed in culture, because they were destructive to the culture, although there were uh, private actions of that nature in, in the course of all human history, because it is a violation, it is a sin, it is what Satan, uh, the devil, would prefer to use to pervert truth and uh, you know, God's intent for all of creation. So I'm not bashful about talking about that. And it's absolutely within the context and framework of the founders relative to the First Great Awakening. And with that, Samuel Adams was very clear on what that meant in relationship to governance. So what I'd like to do today is actually bring back what Samuel Adams had to say, and it's called The American Independence, August 1st, 1776. And these are from the steps of the State House in Philadelphia, and this was the meeting place of the Continental Congress. So with that, what I would like to do now is for you bring Samuel Adams back to life, as this program is called, Samuel Adams Returns. And in this case, he is returning to speak to you today uh, of August 1st regarding the Declaration of Independence. With that, Mr. Adams, countrymen and brethren, I would gladly have declined an honor to which I find myself unequal. I have not the calmness and impartiality which the infinite importance of this occasion demands. I will not deny the charge of my enemies that resentment for the accumulated injuries of our country and an adder for her glory rising to the enthusiasm may deprive me of that accuracy of judgment and expression which men of cooler passions may possess. Let me beseech you then to hear me with caution, to examine without prejudice, and to correct the mistakes into which I may be hurried by my zeal. Truth loves an appeal to the common sense of mankind. Your unperverted understanding can best determine on subjects of a practical nature. The positions and plans which are said to be above the comprehension of the multitude may be always suspected to be visionary and fruitless. He who made all men hath made the truths necessary to human happiness obvious to all." Our forefathers threw off the yoke of popery and religion, for you is reserved the honor of leveling the popery of politics. 
they open the Bible to all and maintain the capacity of every man to judge for himself in religion, are we sufficient for the comprehension of the sublimest spiritual truths and unequal to material and temporal ones? Heaven hath trusted us with the management of things for eternity, and man denies us ability to judge of the present or to know from our feelings the experience that will make us happy? You can discern, say they, objects distant and remote, but cannot perceive those within your grasp. Let us have the distribution of present goods, and cut out and manage, as you please, the interest of futurity. This day, I trust, the reign of political Protestantism will commence. We have explored the temple of royalty and found that the idol we have bowed down to has ears which hear not, eyes which see not, and cannot hear our prayers, and a heart like the nether millstone. We have this day returned the sovereign, the sovereign of the universe, to whom alone men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and with his propitious eye beholds his subjects, assuming that freedom of thought and dignity of self-direction which he bestowed on them. From the rising to the setting of the sun, may his kingdom come, may his kingdom come. Having been a slave to the influence of opinions early acquired and distinctions generally received, I am ever inclined not to despise but pity those who are yet in darkness. But to the eye of reason, what can be more clear than that all men have an equal right to happiness? Nature made no other distinction that of a higher or lower degree of power of mind and body. But what mysterious distribution of character has the craft of a statesman more fatal than priestcraft introduced? According to their doctrine, the offspring of perhaps the lewd embraces of a successful invader shall from generation to generation aggregate the right of lavishing on their pleasures a proportion of the fruits of the earth more sufficient to supply the wants of thousands of their fellow creatures. They claim authority to manage them like beasts of burden and without superior industry, capacity, or virtue. Nay, though disgraceful to humanity by their ignorance, intemperance, and brutality shall be deemed best calculated to the frame laws and to consult for the welfare of society. Were the talents and virtues which heaven has bestowed on men given merely to make them more obedient drudges to be sacrificed to the follies and ambition of a few? Or were not the noble gifts so equally dispensed with a divine purpose and law that they should as nearly as possible be equally exerted and the blessings of providence be equally enjoyed by all. Away, then, with those absurd systems which, to gratify the pride of a few, debase the greatest part of our species below the order of men. What an affront to the king of the universe! to maintain that the happiness of a monster sunk in debauchery and spreading desolation and murder among men of a Caligula, a Nero, or a Charles is more precious in his sight than that of millions of his supplement creatures who do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God? No! In the judgment of heaven, there is no other superiority among men than a superiority in wisdom and virtue. And can we have a safer model in our forming of ours 
The deity then has not given any order or family of men authority over others. And if any man have given it, they only could give it for themselves. Our forefathers, tis said, consented to be subject to the laws of Great Britain. I will not at present dispute it, nor mark out the limits and conditions of their submission. But will it be denied that they contracted to pay obedience and to be under the control of Great Britain because it appeared to them most beneficial in their present circumstances and situations? We, my countrymen, have the same right to consult and provide our happiness, which they had to promise theirs, if... They had a view of posterity in their contracts. It must have been to advance the felicity of their descendants. If they erred in their expectations and prospects, we can never be condemned for a conduct which they would have recommended had they foreseen our present condition. Ye darkeners of counsel, who would make the property, lives, and religion of millions depend on the evasive interpretations of musty parchments, who would send us to antiquated charters of uncertain and contradictory meaning to prove that the present generation are not bound to be victims to cruel and unforgiving despotism? Tell us, whether our pious and generous ancestors bequeath to us the miserable privilege of having the reward of our honest industry, the fruits of those fields which they purchased and bled for, wrestled from us at the will of men over whom we have no check. Did they contract for us that which folded arms, we should expect the justice and mercy from brutal and inflamed invaders which have been denied our supplications at the foot of the throne? Were we to hear our character as a people ridiculed with indifference? Did they promise for us that our meekness and patience should be insulted, our coast harassed, our towns demolished and plundered, and our wives and offsprings exposed to nakedness, hunger, and death without our feelings of resentment of men and exerting those powers of self-preservation which God has given us? They were dear. No. No, let me state this. No man had once a greater veneration for Englishmen than I entertain. They were dear to me as branches of the same parental trunk and partakers of the same religion and laws. I still view them with respect and remains of their constitution as I would a lifeless body which had once been animated by great and heroic souls. But when I am roused by the din of arms when I behold legions of foreign assassins paid by the Englishmen to embrew their hands in our blood, when I tread over the uncoffined bones of my countrymen, neighbors and friends, when I see the locks of a venerable father torn by savage hands and a feeble mother clasping her infant to her bosom and on her knees imploring their lives from her own slaves, who Englishmen have allured to treacheries and murder, when I behold my countrymen, once the seat of industry, peace and plenty, changed by the Englishmen to a theater of blood and misery, heaven forgive me if I cannot root out those passions which it has implanted in my bosom and detested submission to a people who have either ceased to be human or have not virtue enough to feel their own wretchedness and servitude. Ladies and gentlemen, I stop at this moment so that we may continue in the next section of Samuel Adams' returns and continue to understand that America was once enslaved by the parliamentary powers which now today are being done in America by the Congress with many forms of legislation and treaties, as well as by the court's usurpation and tyrannies. Join me again here on Liberty Works Radio Network as Samuel Adams will continue with his speech from August 1st, 1776, 
in respect to the Declaration of Independence. Thank you for being with me, and again, so soon in the near future. Future. We now continue with Samuel Adams as he brings us his speech from August 1st, 1776, and what he was giving as his ideas around that which he fought his whole life for, the Declaration of Independence and the Independence of America. We continue. Mr. Adams, please. Men who content themselves with the semblance of truth and a display of words talk much of our obligations to Great Britain for protection. Had she a single eye to our advantage? A nation of shopkeepers are very seldom so disinterested. Let us not be so amused with words. The extension of her commerce was her object. When she defended our coast, she fought for her customers and convoyed our ships loaded with wealth, which we had acquired for her by our industry. She has treated us as a beast of burden whom the lordly masters cherish that they may carry a greater load. Let us inquire also against whom she has protected us, against her own enemies with whom we had no quarrel, or only on her account, and against whom we always readily exerted our wealth and strength when they were required." Were these colonies backward in giving assistance to Great Britain when they were called upon in 1739 to aid the expedition against the Carthaginians? They, at that time, sent 3,000 men to join the British army, although the war commenced without their consent. But the last war, to said, was purely American. This is a vulgar error, which, like many others, has gained credit by being confidently repeated. The dispute between the courts of Great Britain and France related to the limits of Canada and Nova Scotia. The controverted territory was not claimed by any in the colonies, but by the crown of Great Britain. It was therefore their own quarrel the infringement of a right which England had by the Treaty of Utrecht of trading in the Indian country of Ohio was another cause of the war. The French seized large quantities of British manufacturers and took possession of a fort which a company of British merchants and factors had erected for the security of their commerce. The war was therefore waged in defense of lands claimed by the crown and for the protection of British property. The French at that time had no quarrel with America, and as appears by letters sent from their commander-in-chief to some of the colonies wished to remain in peace with us. The part, therefore, which we then took, and the miseries to which we exposed ourselves, ought to be charged to our affection for Britain. These colonies granted more than their proportion to the support of the war. They raised, clothed, maintained nearly 25,000 men, and so sensible were the people of England of our great exertions that a message was annually sent to the House of Commons purporting, quote, that his majesty, being highly satisfied with the zeal and vigor with which his faithful subjects in North America had exerted themselves in defense of his majesty's just rights and possessions, recommended it to the house to take the same into consideration and enable him to give them a proper compensation, end quote. But what purpose can arguments of this kind answer? that the protection we received annual of our rights as men and lay us under an obligation of being miserable? Who among you, my countrymen, that is a father, would claim authority to make your child a slave because you had nourished him in his infancy? It is a strange species of generosity which requires a return infinitely more valuable than anything it could have bestowed that demands as a reward for a defense of our property 
a surrender of those inestimable privileges to the arbitrary will of vindictive tyrants, which alone give value to your very property. Political right and public happiness are different words for the same idea. They who wander into the metaphysical lambrets or have recourse to original contracts to determine the rights of men either impose on themselves or mean to delude others. Public utility is the only certain criterion. It is a test which brings disputes to a speedy decision and makes it appeal to the feelings of mankind. The force of truth has obliged men to use arguments drawn from this principle who were combating it in practice and speculation. The advocates for a despotic government and non-resistance to the magistrate employ reasons in favor of their systems drawn from the consideration of their tendency to promote public happiness. Ha! Huh. Did you hear that? The author of nature directs all his operations to the production of the greatest good and has made human virtue to consist in a disposition and conduct which tend to the common felicity of his creatures. An abridgment of the natural freedom of man by the institution of political societies is vindictable only on this foot. How absurd, then, is it to draw argument from the nature of civil society for the annihilation of those very ends which society was intended to procure. Men associate for their mutual advantage. Hence, the good and happiness of the members, that is, the majority of the members of any state, is the great standard by which everything relates to that state must finally be determined. And though it may be that it may be supposed that a body of people may be bound by a voluntary resignation, which they have been so infatuated as to make of all their interest to a single person or to a few, it can never be conceived that the resignation is obligatory to their posterity, because it is manifestly contrary to the good of the whole that it should be so. These are the sentiments of the wisest and most virtuous champions of freedom. Attend to a portion on this subject from a book in our defense, written, I have almost said, by the pen of inspiration. And I quote, I lay no stress, says he, on charters. They derive their rights from a higher source. It is inconsistent with common sense to imagine that any people would ever think of settling in a distant country on any such condition, or that the people from whom they withdrew should forever be masters of their property and have power to subject them to any modes of government they pleased and that their men express stipulations to this purpose in all the charters of the colonies, they would, in my opinion, be no more bound by them if it had happened to be stipulated with them that they should go naked or expose themselves to the incursions of wolves and tigers." End quote. Such are the opinions of every virtuous and enlightened patriot in Great Britain. Their petition to heaven is, quote, that there may be one free country left upon earth to which they may fly when venality, luxury, and vice shall have completed the ruin of liberty there, end quote. Courage then, my countrymen. Our contest is not only whether we ourselves shall be free, but whether there shall be left to mankind an asylum on earth for the civil and religious liberty. Dismissing, therefore, the justice of our cause as incontestable, the only question is, what is best for us to pursue in our present circumstances? The doctrine of dependence on Great Britain is, I believe, generally exploded 
but as I would attend to the honest weakness of the simplest of men, you will pardon me if I offer a few words on that subject. We are now on this continent to be the astonishment of the world. Three million souls united in one common cause. We have large armies, well-disciplined and appointed, with commanders inferior to none in military skill and superior in activity and zeal. We are furnished with arsenals and stores beyond our most sanguine, cheerfully optimistic expectations. And foreign nations are waiting to crown our successes by their alliances. There are instances of, I would say, an almost astonishing providence in our favor. Our success has staggered our enemies and almost given faith to infidels so that we may truly say it is not our own arm which has saved us. It is that of the sovereign of heaven. The hand of heaven appears to have led us on to be perhaps humble instruments and means in the great providential dispensation which is completing. We have fled from the political Sodom, Let us not look back, lest we perish and become a monument of infamy and derision to the world. For can we ever expect more unanimity and a better preparation for defense, more infatuation of counsel among our enemies, and more valor and zeal among ourselves? The same force and resistance which are sufficient to procure us our liberties will secure us a glorious independence and support us in the dignity of free imperial states. We cannot suppose that our opposition has made a corrupt and disparate nation more friendly to America or created in them a greater respect for the rights of mankind. We can therefore expect a restoration and establishment of our privileges and a compensation for the injuries we have received from their want of power from their fears, and not from their virtues. The unanimity and valor which will effect an honorable peace can render a future contest for our liberties unnecessary. He who has strength to chain down the wolf is a madman if he lets him loose without drawing his teeth and parting his nails. Ladies and gentlemen, I have so much more to say in just a few minutes to complete this, which I think that I will take and spare you until the next segment. At this time, it is imperative that America look to its truths and what it is fighting. England is not that 3,000 miles away. It is today only 3,000 miles away from coast to coast in America, where the center of an evil government has taken up its usurpation and tyranny and is enslaving the people of America with those that it prefers from a position of commerce, protecting those as what we thought about in 1776, that you have the international commerce, as it was then, is true today, is that which would enslave every resource and every person for their own purposes, destroying the individual dignity of religious freedom and the ideas of a God-determined nation. This nation, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, is one nation under God. I will always stand on the firm words that it is the sovereign of heaven that every man must turn to and give account for. Every person in political office has that higher authority that they must answer to in this body, in time and space, or they will answer to him in all of eternity. And they will be disposed of according to that which they do in this time. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to return to Samuel Adams again as we move and hear what I have to say in some conclusion of the next segment relative 
to the Declaration of Independence and what I brought to you as a nation on August 1st, 1776. Come back again here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we quickly continue with Samuel Adams here on Liberty Works Radio Network regarding his speech on August 1st, 1776 in, re in respect to the Declaration of Independence. Mr. Adams, please continue. From the day on which the accommodation takes place between England and America, on any other term than the independent states, I shall date the ruin of this country. A political minister will study to lull us into security by granting us the full extent of our petitions. The warm sunshine of influence would melt down the virtue which the violence of the storm rendered more firm and unyielding. In a state of tranquility, wealth, and luxury, our descendants would forget the arts of war and the noble activity and zeal which made their ancestors invincible. Every art of corruption would be employed to loosen the bond of union which renders our assistance formidable. When the spirit of liberty which now animates our hearts and gives success to our arms is extinct, our numbers will be accelerated of our ruin and render us easier victims to tyranny. The abandoned minions of an infatuated ministry, if uncertainty or doubt any should yet remain among us, remember that a Warren and a Montgomery are numbered among the dead, complete with the mangled bodies of our countrymen, and then say, contemplate this. What should be the reward of such sacrifices? Bid us in our posterity bow the knee, supplicate the friendship and plow, and sow and reap to glut the avarice of the men who have let loose on us the dogs of war to riot in our blood and hunt us from the face of the earth? If we love wealth better than liberty, tranquility of servitude, then the animating contest of freedom go from us in peace. We ask not your counsel or arms, crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that ye were our countrymen. To unite the supremacy of Great Britain and the liberty of America is utterly impossible. So vast a continent of such a distinct and distance from a seat of empire will every day grow more unmanageable. The motion of so unwieldy a body cannot be directed with any dispatch and uniformity without committing to the Parliament of Great Britain powers inconsistent with our freedom. The authority and force which would be absolutely necessary for the preservation of the peace and good order of this continent would put all our valuable rights within the reach of that nation, in the reach of tyranny, in the reach of slavery and usurpation. As the administration of government requires firmer and more numerous supports in proportion to its extent, the burdens imposed on us would be excessive, and we should have the melancholy prospect of their increasing on our posterity. The scale of officers, from the rapacious and needy commissioner to the haughty governor, and from the governor with his hungry train to perhaps a licentious and prodigal viceroy, must be upheld by you and your children. The fleets and armies which will be employed to silence your murmurs and complaints must be supported by the fruits of your industry. And yet, with all this enlargement of the expense and power of government, the administration of it at such a distance and over such an extensive territory must necessarily fail of putting the laws into vigorous execution, removing private oppressions, and forming plans for the advancement of agriculture and commerce and preserving the vast empire 
in any tolerable peace and security. If our posterity retain any spark of patriotism, they can never tamely submit to such burdens. This country will be made the field of bloody contention till it gains that independence for which nature formed it. It is therefore injustice and cruelty to our offsprings and would stamp us with the character and cruelty and baseness and cowardice to leave the salvation of this country to be worked out by them with accumulated difficulty and danger. That is taxation and impending evil legislation. Prejudice, I confess, may warp our judgment. Let us hear the decision of Englishmen on this subject who cannot be subject to a, a suspect of partiality. Quote, the Americans, they say, are but little short of half our number. To this number they have grown from a small body of original settlers to a very rapid increase. The probability is that they will go on to increase and that in 50 or 60 years they will be double our number and form a mighty empire consisting of a variety of states, all equal or superior to ourselves in all the arts and accomplishments which give dignity and happiness to human life. In that period, they will be still bound to acknowledge the supremacy over them which we now claim? Can there be any person who will assert this or whose mind does not revolt at the idea of a vast continent holding all that is valuable to it at the discretion of a handful of people on the other side of the Atlantic or in your modern times in Washington, D.C.? But if at that period this would be unreasonable, what makes it otherwise now? Draw that line if you can. But there is still a great difficulty. Britain is now, I will suppose, the seat of liberty and virtue, and its legislature consists of a body of able and independent men who govern with wisdom and justice. The time may come when all will be reversed, when its excellent constitution of government will be subverted, when pressed by debts and taxes, it will be greedy to draw to itself an increase of revenue from every distinct providence in order to ease its own burdens when the influence of the crown, strengthened by luxury and the universal profligacy, licentiousness and dissolute of manners or disillusion of manners, will have tainted every heart, broken down every fence of liberty, and rendered us a nation of tame and content vassals, when a general election will be nothing but a general auction of boroughs, and when the parliament, the grand council of the nation, and once the faithful guardian of the state and the terror to evil ministers will be degenerated into a body of psychophants, dependent and venal, always ready to confirm any measure and little more than a public court for registering royal edicts. Such, it is possible, may some time or other be the state of Great Britain. No, it is the state of that Congress, presidency, and courts in America in the present. What will at that period be the duty of the colonies? Will they be still bound by unconstitutional submissions? Oh my, must they always continue an appendage of our government and follow it implicitly through the, every change that can happen to it? Wretched condition indeed of millions of freemen as good as ourselves. Will you say that now govern equitably and that there is no danger in such a revolution? Would to God that this were true. But will you not always say the same? Who shall judge whether we govern equitably or not? Can you give the colonies any security that such a period will never come? No, the period, countrymen, is already come. The calamities were at our door. The rod of oppression was raised over us. We were roused from our slumbers, and may we never sink into repose until we can convey a clear and undisputed inheritance to our posterity. This day, we are called upon to give a glorious example of what the wisest and best men were rejoiced to view 
only in speculation. This day presents the world with the most august spectacle that its annals ever unfolded. Millions of freemen deliberately and voluntarily forming themselves into a society for their common defense and common happiness. Immortal spirits of Hamden, Locke, and Sydney, will it not add to your benevolent joys to behold your posterity rising to the dignity of men and advising to the world the reality and expediency of your system and the actual enjoyments of that equal liberty which you were happy when on earth in delineating and recommending to mankind. Other nations have received their laws from conquerors. Some are indebted for a constitution to the sufferings of their ancestors through revol revolving centuries. The people of this country alone have formally and deliberately chosen a government for themselves and with open and influenced consent bound themselves to social compact. Here no man proclaims his birth or wealth as a title to honorable distinction or to sanctify ignorance and vice with the name of hereditary authority. He who has most zeal and ability to promote public felicity, let him be the servant of the public. This is the only line of distinction drawn by nature. Leave the bird of night to the obscurity for which nature intended him, and expect only from the eagle to brush the clouds with his wings and look boldly in the face of the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an insult to your virtue as well as to your common sense that something would be taken away from you. Your unanimity this day and through the course of the war is a decisive refutation of such invicious predictions. Our enemies have already had evidence that our present constitution contains in it the just and ardor freedom, the wisdom and vigor of the most absolute system. When the law is the will of the people, it will be uniform and coherent, but fluctuation, contradiction, and inconsistency of councils must be expected under those governments where every revolution in ministry of a court produces one in the state such being the folly and pride of the ministers that they ever pursue, measurable directly opposite to those of the predecessors. We shall neither be exposed to the necessity that convulses of elective monarchies, nor to the wanton wisdom of fortitude and virtue to which hereditary succession is liable. In your hands it will be to the per perpetude, a prudent, active, and just legislature, and which will never expire until you, you yourselves lose the virtues which give it its existence. Ladies and gentlemen, I must bring us quickly to a point of additional closure. We have to look at this, that the civil magistrate has everywhere contaminated religion by making it an engine of policy and freedom of thought, and the right of privilege, private judgment in matters of conscience driven from every other corner of the earth, direct their course to this happy country as their last asylum. Let us cherish the noble guests and shelter them under the wings of a universal toleration. And by that does not mean immoral toleration. What that meant was according to what we understood as biblical Puritan Reformation ethics. Toleration was that of biblical toleration across the various denominations of the day. Be this the seat of unbounded religious freedom. And we meant the freedom of biblical standards. She will bring with her in her train industry, wisdom, and commerce. She thrives most when left to shoot forth in her natural luxuriance and ask for human policy only not to be checked in her growth by artificial encouragements. Thus, by the benefits of providence, we shall behold our empire arousing founded on justice and voluntary consent of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to our liberties under God in this nation. 
as independent states joined together in unanimity with liberty and justice for all, being defined by that which the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords of the whole universe has qualified. Thank you for joining me here on Liberty Works Radio Network as Samuel Adams returns. And yes, the Anti-Federalists got it right. Have a wonderful 4th of July, which means enjoy your liberties for this day. Day. <laughs>